Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's NAC at Home program. Um, our featured artists today are with Performa. My name is Laura Daly, and I, along with Don Lilly, am co-chairs of the Dance Committee. For those of you who are not familiar with the National Arts Club, we are a 501c3 nonprofit based in New York City with the mission to stimulate, foster, and promote public interest in the arts. Annually, the club offers more than 150 free programs to the public. These include exhibitions, theatrical, musical performances, lectures, and readings. For more information about the National Arts Club, you can visit us at nationalartsclub.org or find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. This event will be recorded and posted within 24 hours on the NAC's YouTube channel for you to share with your friends or watch again. Following tonight's presentation, there will be a Q&A, so please feel free to use the Q&A function for any questions you may have. And now I would like to introduce my dance committee co-chair, Dawn Lilly, who will introduce tonight's guests. Take it away, Dawn. Thank you, Laura. Performer, the subject of tonight's program, is a multidiscipline, forward-looking organization that for many, many years has offered a performance festival to all of New York uh, that is often very forward-looking and very unusual. Tonight's two guests who represent Performer are Charles Oban, who's the curator and the head of publications for the organization. Uh, Charles has worked with all kinds of people, um, performers, choreographers, architects, filmmakers. He has co-edited several books and edited others. Uh, one he worked uh, with Aperture Magazine uh, on an issue um, that related uh, photography and performance. And another he co-edited that uh, a publication on the use of performance by architects. Our second presenter tonight is Rosalie Goldberg. Rosalie is the founding director and chief curator of Performer, uh, an art historian and critic. She's taught at NYU since about 1987. She's published two books on performance, the first of which was almost a Bible for anyone teaching dance or dance history. Uh, and she is also curator at large for the Zeitz Museum of Contemporary Art in Cape Town. But when I think of Rosalie, I think of the kitchen, which is a performance venue far west on 19th Street in New York that she was in charge of for many years. And I remember going to performances and standing outside in the freezing cold wind coming from the Hudson, uh, huddling. And all of a sudden the doors would open, everybody would run in, and you never knew what you were gonna see by whom. But after the performance, those silent freezing people from the beginning would come running out, everybody talking at once. Some loved it, some hated it, some didn't understand what went on, but there was talk and there was thinking. And that was such a wonderful thing. And I think that's why Performer is as well. So here are your two guests for tonight. Thank you. I have to respond to your wonderful introduction. I love that comment about the kitchen. Indeed, we used to be, I remember once uh, John Cage calling me and saying, can somebody please come down and open the door for me? There's such a crowd outside, I can't get in. So yes, and I like you beginning there because indeed, um, performer picks up that same kind of ethos. Uh, I began it in 2004 as an, just as an idea uh, and went into full speed to create this biennial on live performance by artists. Um, because I also felt that, that I loved what you said about the arguments, the conversations, uh, did we like it? Did we hate it? What should we do? What can we take from it? But I, what I love especially is that you've never forgotten it. So with Performa, we launched the very first biennial in 2005. Uh, we called it Performa 05. And the idea right then was to 
take this extraordinary history, which reaches all the way back, well, actually to the Renaissance, if we go all the way back. I'm an art historian, so I, I, I can never go far back enough. Uh, where, of course, doing live performance, live events was part of the um, the job description of an artist in the, in the courts of uh, Italy. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci famously created many events for uh, Count Sforza in Milan. Um, there were all kinds of extraordinary uh, uh, dinners and processions designed by artists. So it's not new uh, and that that artists have, have done made performances. Uh, I began my book, the original book, which I will start to show you if I can just scare, uh, scare the, share the screen, screen, screen the share, <laughs> share the screen, if you can just bear with me. Um, and um, so um, these are just a collection of extraordinary images that have come out of the last 15 years of Performer. Uh, so to tell you again the story, some of you, I'm sure, listening know your art history, and we will also talk about dance here, but I thought I'd give you a more general introduction, because, of course, as uh, Charles Bio uh, explains, and as my own history, uh, all of us at Perform are really are truly multidisciplinary. We all come with many different backgrounds in dance and architectural history and uh, in painting and, and, you know, and the arts in general. And so incorporated in this original book, which if you look at the top on the, your left of the screen, 1979 was the very first book on the history of performance. And what I did with that was essentially look at the history of art of the 20th century, uh, insisting that it's always been a multi multidisciplinary uh, century, right from, right from the start, artists were making performances, creating events, um, and maybe it was just the art historians and the critics and the museum curators who didn't really know where to put these strange things called a Dada event that took place in Zurich in, in 1916, or what was going on at the Bauhaus in the 20s, those of you who follow uh, the, the kind of Western art history. And uh, so I felt that to go back and look at the history of 20th century art and really just open those passages where uh, performance had been left out of this history, more on account that people simply didn't know what to do with it or how to explain. Uh, so I'm going to answer your question, why did I know a little bit about my own background? I grew up in South Africa uh, during apartheid. I think it was a time to, uh, I think I was deeply influenced by everything you can imagine in South Africa from uh, the politics, which was a constant, to the extraordinary African music, the Zulu that was sort of part of my native language around me, uh, the music, the dance, and there was no separation between the arts there. Also a profound influence of politics and how that charged art and changed the art and architecture and urbanism of the cities we were living in. So this to give you some sense of um, entry into this material that you might know a lot of art history or you might feel this is totally foreign. But the reality is uh, once you start going through this material, you'll see that I really spread it out and try to look at the larger uh, cultural, political, social issues of the time and see how did this emerge, why and what was going on. Uh, because of course, uh, people tend to know about performance from the 70s, or consider it really a very provocative form, really using it in some ways that's very conceptual in other ways to protest uh, the Vietnam War and so on. So it's always been thought of as, as a kind of rather, as an irritant and a kind of a question mark. But, um, you know, at the same time, in, right in line with what visual artists are doing. So I'm just going to take you very quickly more through images to plant some images in your mind, not through the whole history. Uh, and then I'm going to ask Charles Oban, uh, one of our terrific curators, a performer, to take you through the projects that we're about to launch now in uh, 2021. And we will also answer some questions for specifically about dance for those who are coming, um, who are part of this dance uh, sub club within within the national arts so uh these are the several books uh, there are many more that we've done with performer that that uh show this different different aspects of the history um you might notice a book on laurie anderson that i wrote in probably 2000 it's a wonderful article coming up on her this weekend 
in the, the Times Magazine. She has a show at the Hirschhorn. So the interesting part about this material is how current it is. And in a sense, how performance is such a flexible, uh, ongoing medium. It's not something that just suddenly appears some, at some point. It's really always inherently in the, the culture as it relates to this history of art that we follow so closely. So to give you, again, some very uh, key moments from the past. So uh, again, if you if you look at the early book that, that uh, has been called The Bible, uh, and I must say what's fun is that it's been in print for 42 years. It's never been out of print. It's now in 14 languages, and I'm currently updating it for a fourth edition to cover the last 10 years. Um, so I'm not going to take you through any history, but rather uh, some key moments in performance history. A wonderful piece by Mike Kelly, for some of you who know his work. Again, the idea here was to work with artists who maybe some who have done performance before, but just as frequently people who've never done performance before. And um, often it, the inspiration is to look at the work they do and then go and ask the artists just very simply, would you consider doing a live work? Because the, the material that you make seems to suggest that it could be quite marvelous as a live work. So we have an extraordinary history of uh, successful productions, um, exciting productions with these artists, with different artists taking on uh, this proposal, would you go live? That was a wonderful project actually by Laurie Simmons. Some of you might know the artist slash photographer slash filmmaker, very critical in the late seventies with, uh, as part of the pictures generation, the generation of artists coming um, in, into New York from CalArts, from all, all parts of the States and really looking at the, the proliferation of image making and the beginning of huge discussion that's with us still, of course, about technology. And again, for the dance lovers, uh, the dance inside that gun is from the Alvin Ailey company. So again, we try to include all kinds of wonderful conversations with different artists. Again, just images to, uh, to, to entice you, wonderful work by a Brazilian artist called Laura Lima. Uh, this was a fun piece. It was uh, when one year when we were celebrating the, the Renaissance, because as the historian, I'm always trying to show that in fact, this has gone on for a long time to bring history into the present and to show how uh, exciting history is, it, that history in a way is the record of radical times. And in this case, uh, we were uh, looking at the Renaissance and um, actually the, the, the uh, conceit here was that all these costumes were hung up on a, on a rail, as you can see in the back, um, for the visitors, for the audience. And you could actually you know, hang your own clothes or just put these gowns on over your clothes. And this was, these were audience members, part of the people who came in and really position themselves with this clothing on them. But along the story, I'm not going to take you through direct details. We've always used the city we, we, from the beginning. Uh, there's a love affair. I think we all, all of, a, all of us who live in New York City are basically addicted. I think we don't really know how to live without it. And um, so we've a lot of many, many projects that are outdoors. Um, this is Paul, uh, Pablo Bronstein, who's based in England and does, again, a lot of work having to do with architecture, actually also the Renaissance and so on. Um, another wonderful piece by a Mexican artist called Carlos Amorales, which was done with a sound piece. This is a Polish artist, uh, Pavel Altheimer. Again, a wonderful work that he built and that had you could walk through it and had events related. Uh, that was a kind of the idea of the Statue of Liberty lying down and taken celebrating a figure in Harlem who was called the Queen Mother of Harlem, who was dealing with homeless, um, sort of a really patron saint for the homeless. A, a wonderful, wonderful piece we did with an uh, Icelandic artist, Ragnar Kjarsson. Uh, believe it or not, it was lasted 12 hours, uh, started at noon, it ended at midnight, and it was the one song, I don't know if any of you know what that would be, the one, the last aria of Marriage of Figaro, uh, which, as I say, I was done with a, a cast of opera singers from Iceland and uh, a, a miracle work that uh, has been, anyone who saw it can't forget it. It's really deeply embedded in, in memory and uh, a fabulously exciting piece. 
Um, so again, the, the range of work we do is, is infinite. We've, we have sub, subdivisions without calling them that. This was part of an architecture program that Charles put together. Um, and you get the idea, this is actually based on a 1960s drawing about the future habitats, the way we would live put into a contemporary context and the globe uh, moved around different parts of the city. And we had worked with a dance company and a dance teacher out of California and somebody in France. So bringing all these different people together and actually talking about these projects, reminding me how a very international performer has been from day one, which again is, is sort of quite unusual in a New York City context to start a, a totally new organization with from scratch with no, no city backing no support in that way at all, just sheer determination. And yet from the start, we've been international, bringing uh, really thrilling work from many different parts of the world. Um, a piece by that was um, an English artist called Eddie Peak, uh, also quite wonderful. The, the eight dancers start out painted and then sort of merge and mess, mess each other up. A beautiful work by um, American artist and uh, that was done uh, as part of our, um, our, it was part of a performer hub that we had, and name is slipping for a minute, Charles. If you can help me, I'm just remembering. Area, please. Sorry, thank Here. you. Marvelous artist who works uh, in sculpture and sound. Some of you might have seen beautiful, beautiful installations of the last Venice Biennial. Um, and again, sadly, this was his last major performance. He passed away much too early but it was something that we were all completely enthralled by. Um, again, somebody who had never done live performance before, a painter, uh, and uh, she was always obsessed. She grew up in Washington with Japanese kabuki, and Iola Brown was her is her name, and we really helped her produce her first live performance, which was quite spectacular, um, working with the ninja, uh, uh, people from uh, Harlem uh, Balls who had actually helped to create various dances that went with the work and a, a really spectacular piece by a very young artist who now is in at the uh, at MoMA, so Adam Pendleton. And this also has a wonderful story because he was really only 23 when he did this project. Um, I had just heard him do a, a reading um, I know somebody was asking me today, like, how do you make these decisions? And I said, it's, it's sort of purely instinctive. You, it's like walking, meeting someone, you decide you want to marry them or falling in love. Um, it's really artwork that seems to say, speak about what could happen in a live situation. So Adam, I met very early on. I heard him at a, give a reading uh, in front of him, sort of very beautiful, simple paintings that he had made of poetry that he was writing. And I said, what about doing a performer commission? And he, this early on 2007, he brought together 40 members of a gospel choir. He designed the set. He had Jason Moran, who now also um, all these years later is possibly considered one of the most important jazz musicians, avant-garde jazz musicians in this country and abroad. So we, we really also have a reputation for discovering, uncovering, revealing artists in a, in a very exciting way. I mean, Adam is a terrific artist. You will see it in his show as he takes up the whole atrium at MoMA this month. Um, and he, I'm sure he would have made it, but if somebody said performers and an, an accelerator. I think this, this event the next day was sort of front page of Times Art and Leisure, almost with the, the title. I don't think it was, but it felt like a star is born. It was the sense that he had arrived fully formed out of somebody's head. No one had heard of him before and people were enthralled. So it's that level of excitement. And maybe one more that I'll discuss uh, so that we can move into the next part. Um, this was a wonderful piece. Some of you might also know of the work of Rashid Johnson, a uh, terrific painter who's, uh, I think, again, is getting enormous amount of attention at the moment. He's not just at the moment, he's, he's a, a profoundly interesting artist, both in terms of his painting. And then, as we do, uh, this came about because I would say to Rashid whenever I saw him, Rashid, 
can we please do a live event? Would you ever consider doing a performance? I just love your work. I know you don't do performance, but the day that you have an idea, please let me know. And uh, he just said one day, I have an idea and I'd like to do Amira Baraka's Dutchman, but I want to do it in the, in the baths, the Turkish baths on 10th Street. So here we're looking at, uh, at the action going on. The, the audience, this fellow in, in the white robe, that's the audience and the two actors um, are there um, uh, in, in also in their bathing suits. And uh, again, an unforgettable and very real uh, in a sense of, you know, we're in the heat of these dreadfully, uh, you know, the, 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 sub, the subterranean heat of the saunas in, in the Turkish baths. Uh, not a spa, by the way, they're definitely baths. Um, and, uh, you, you know, to match the subject matter, which is this uh, young couple, that, well, not a couple, two individuals sitting on a subway train in New York in the heat, they start talking to each other and it ends rather uh, tragically, uh, but it's almost the heat of the production simultaneously uh, went up as the heat inside the room went up. So um, again, is this theater, is this, uh, the imagination of the artist really comes forward and comes across so magnificently in each of these pieces. And again, Rashid, some of you might know that he then went on to make a very important film called Native Son that was done with a major um, you know, streaming service. And uh, what's interesting that he said that working on this piece for performer uh, somehow ignited this idea of directing for him. And he's really, uh, now, you know, works in, in performance in a very uh, exciting manner, but of course still continues his painting. Um, again, not going to go, I promise I wouldn't go into detail, just images, but this again, a wonderful piece by Edgar Arsenault, um, another piece by an Indian artist, uh, Gupta, who's, who actually came and cooked for um, 60 people every night, um, and really fantastic. Uh, different kinds of works. So the, the idea here is, as, as in the introduction, we've commissioned works that include film. This is a work by Mika Rottenberg, uh, who we managed to get to South Africa. She says she wanted to go to Africa, so I managed to find a residency for her. So again, perform a very nimble organization. We, our commitment is absolutely 100% to the artists. Uh, whatever they dream up, we work with them to try to realize um, it's kind of quite a miracle and everything, you know, I'm sure that I, I would say that, again, the courage of the artist to take on these different, uh, different possibilities is really what's fabulous. Uh, again, back to the painting world, uh, extraordinary artist who just had a major show at the Whitney Museum, Julie Moretto, um, a lovely uh, genesis of this piece too. Similarly to Rashid, I said to Julie, whenever you have an idea, let me know. And uh, she did, we were standing together once at uh, an event downtown, she said, I have an idea. And I, I was so excited. And she, she proceeded to say that she was working in this huge church uptown. And, um, and she, Jason Moran had said that she He'd lost his studio and he, he, she said, he said, she said, move in. Anyway, this terrific collaboration that came about. So again, just trying to give you a sense of the adventurousness of the organization, the courage of the artists to go ahead and uh, sort of take this incredible leap into, into unknown territory, uh, possibly, you know, you know, well-known artists, young, unheard of artists, artists who are really just fascinated to uh, treat you know, this, this invitation as an opportunity to create works that they just couldn't do elsewhere. And then this wonderful sense of uh, the possibility and the possibility to keep going because suddenly there's an understanding that performance does a few things. It really reaches people directly. I think whether you know your history of art or not, uh, somehow being in front of another body, you can make up your own mind and respond. Um, and somehow this, this sense of... Uh, being public, being out there for people as we are very much this year, I think that's going to be very, very interesting and, and really bring a lot more people. Just for the dance lovers in here, uh, you might notice on the right is David Hallberg, uh, recently the uh, chief uh, prince of all princes at ABT, who's now head of uh, the Australian Ballet. Uh, who was part of a, a work that is of a work that we did when we were. Uh, using part of performance to look at the Renaissance. Um, so 
and again, the, the extent that we go to, to realize these dreams, this is uh, part of the uh, Francesco Vizzoli's piece that included David Holberg. Uh, we worked with somebody who recreated a Renaissance stage as the way it used to be in the old days that uh, somehow it was built into the court. And we had this it's beautiful, beautiful performance, by the way, uh, Mucci Prada uh, through Francesco Vizzoli, who, was who is close to her, designed uh, David Holberg's costume. So uh, lots of, you know, fantasy, imagination, deep, deep knowledge, and a sense of how do we uh, grab the excitement of, of the viewers and Really, I, I love that going back to the introduction, going to the kitchen and knowing that you, you wouldn't know what you were going to see, but in a way you would never forget those conversations or what you or the visuals of what hit you, which is really what we promise um, at Performer. Another piece, and then, uh, then it's really yours to go, Charles, uh, that uh, from 2017 that was uh, created by Barbara Kruger, a major artist, of course, who uh, we said, Barbara, take New York. Um, and this was a piece where she came up with this idea. Again, she wanted to be very, very public. It was just after 2016. She had lots of things on her mind and created um, these, her, her signature writing that she took over the skateboard park under the, the Brooklyn, under the Manhattan Bridge and created um, all kinds of merchandise. You could take a subway and actually buy a subways design the tickets um, tokens designed by her so there's nothing that we haven't touched that we're uh, that we haven't covered in some way and yet we're always looking for new ways to look at the city new ways to look at artists new ways to think about the values and the um, you know the, the meaning of what it means to follow artists um, as closely as we do. And so that's my intro. Charles, up to you. Thank you very much, Rosalie. Um, I will, um, I need, um, can you, yes, I'm going to share my screen too. Okay. Um, am I out? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Hi everyone. So, um, um, yeah, Charles, Charles Obin. I've been with uh, Performer now for um, almost nine years, and so working on this uh, fifth edition of the Biennial. Um, obviously, this edition is uh, different from the previous ones, even though we went back to you know the core element of why uh, also it exists here. It's uh, the city of New York, definitely as. Rosalie mentioned. Um, so the focus again is the city and this year as in the previous years uh, if you join the biennial you will go from uh, Rockaway Beach to Harlem to the Rockefeller Center to East Williamsburg. Uh, we're really everywhere in the city. Um, the pandemic obviously changed uh, the way we approached um, the event so from the start we knew that we wanted to do a a maximum of programs um, outdoors. Um, so most of the programs that I'm going to present today will be taking place out, outdoors. Um, and they're all free of charge. That was also something that uh, we felt was very important uh, to allow a maximum of people to come attend our programs this year after the past very difficult years we just had. Um, the like Rosalie said earlier this year, we also invited people who had never done anything live in the past, and we've been working with them for two years, uh, sometimes more, uh, doing a lot of, of these Zoom uh, meetings. Uh, they're all um, here in the US, but they're not all American. They're all, um, you know, from Los Angeles to New York to Pittsburgh. Um, and they're all working on uh, works that they will premiere with us. Um, so we open next week on the 12th and it will run and the biennial will run until the 31st. So be prepared for three weeks uh, of programs. This year uh, we have eight major commissions that um, I'm going to present. Uh, I'm going to go 
quick, uh, quickly on the first six so that we have more time to present the last two that have a stronger dance component. Um, but uh, you can also, if you go on our website, and I believe that the link was uh, put in the chat, uh, you'll be able to also follow our programs, our radio programs, and uh, our live streaming programs, because something that also we decided to put in place this year uh, is to live stream all our pro performances, because um, we always have a very international audience. A lot of people fly from anywhere in the world to come to specific programs this year. It's obviously not possible. And so we wanted to make sure that uh, um, we could still reach uh, this audience. And, and, and to be honest, it's also a way to experiment with very different ways of presenting live performance through the mediation of the screen. And as you'll see, a lot of artists really took on this challenge. Uh, and are really playing with these different possibilities. Um, the first artist I wanted to introduce you to is uh, Chabala Lasself, uh, who you might know mostly for her paintings. So as I said, um, very first performance for her, for instance, um, her paintings often uh, depict uh, like in very geometrical, colorful uh, shapes, uh, scenes of intimate uh, relationships, uh, couples, conversations between uh, close uh, people. And so basically what you should expect um, here in this performance that we're going to present at the Jackie Robinson uh, Park in Harlem uh, in a band shell um, is, some, is as if the characters uh, that you see in the paintings were stepping out of the canvas and they were coming straight to you on the stage. The performance is going to be uh, a, a mix of live um, uh, text-based uh, uh, performance, but also live music and this very ambitious uh, picture, uh, visual world of hers that will be expanded as the, a very large uh, set um, for the performance. Um, Erica Beckman. Uh, so we work really with artists from different uh, generations as uh, also Rosie um, presented earlier. Erica Beckman is someone that you might know uh, as she was associated also with the pictures generation uh, from the 1980s here in New York. Uh, but she's also done a lot of work on the West Coast um, in California. Um, this will be a very large scale performance uh, in which um, she's revisiting uh, the fairy tale um, Jack and the Beanstalk and really um, remixing it, rethinking it um, as a as a, an alternative version that would see the workers revolt against a um, capitalist domination. And so in that story, the uh, giant is basically a metaphor for corporate um, conglomerate. Um, the performance is going to take place in Dumbo at the Brooklyn Bridge, uh, at the Pier, Pier 3 in, uh, in, in, in Brooklyn. And so it will be set with the Manhattan downtown uh, skyline as the back line, uh, the, the backdrop, sorry. And um, it's a very hybrid set with uh, a stage that will be formed of LED screens. Uh, there will be uh, a choir and there will be also um, a circus um, a performer. And so the piece is going to be um, uh, reflecting on this uh, tale with a very contemporary uh, 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 understanding of um, like taking place here in New York in particular. Um, the Amazon Proxy by Danielle Dean. Danielle is a British American artist. This time uh, you will go to Amont, a new uh, foundation in East Williamsburg. Uh, Danielle has been doing a lot of work in the uh, for the archives in, the, in, in, in Michigan. And she's been interested in really confronting the way work was organized and labor was organized at the time with, with the way we all now experience our lives online remotely. And so in her performance that she will present um, at Amont, uh, she's basically um, revisiting a specific history of uh, Ford, the, uh, when in the 20s, um, Henry Ford decided to establish a 
rubber plantation in the Amazon. And then through revisiting these events, she's actually mixing uh, in the, into the, into the, pot, the uh, experience of online gig workers today. As you might know, a lot of work is happening right now uh, online. You do it from home on your laptop. You log on on what's called, for instance, uh, Amazon Mechanical Turk, and you can spend hours uh, responding to questionnaires or um, uh, identifying images. And that is done in a way to train um, artificial intelligence. And so in that case, uh, Danielle is very interested in uh, rethinking the way like the typical Ford um, uh, uh, line of production is rethought globally through uh, this kind of new ways of, um, of, of working that's been implemented by Amazon, for instance. Um, and so this will be a very lush, very uh, large scale um, forest in the gallery space at Amont. Um, we work vis with visual artists, with painters, with, with filmmakers, with theater directors, but we also work with architects. And um, Andres Hake is one of these architects that we have this year as part of the program. Um, he uh, is based in New York, uh, but also works in Spain, in Madrid, where he comes from. And in this case, uh, Andres was interested. He has done a few performances in the past, and that's something that um, we've been very interested at Performa. It's this idea that architects can use um, performance to, I'm sorry. To really expand and question several aspects of their um, practices. And um, in this case, Andres was um, interested in really looking at um, what the new constructions, the new skyscrapers here in New York uh, actually mean more generally for their relationships with other territories outside of New York. And so with a very research-based uh, practice with a lot of uh, research that's been done uh, in the past year and a half, uh, he's been tracking down every single component of how do you make, for instance, this new type of glass that you can see in every um, um, new towers and how by the extraction of silica in Illinois or by the use of fracking in Pennsylvania, this is how you get this kind of like new type of uh, constructions here in New York. And so for Andres, his performance is going to take place actually at the top of the rock. Uh, so on the observation deck um, at the Rockefeller Center. Um, and it will be a very meditative performance, not a lecture, but a very uh, uh, intimate, very uh, sensorial sound, mostly performance at dawn when the sun will rise. Uh, and, and his intention is really to reconnect the city of New York with all these different territories that are actually embedded in each of these constructions that we will be uh, looking at. Um, Shai Keith is a very young new, uh, very young artist uh, that we've been working with over the past two years. Uh, someone that you might know mostly for his, photo his work in photography. Um, so it's going to be his very first um, performance. Um, he approaches it as, a, as, a, as an opera, really as an um, experimental opera that will be taking place on the beach in Rockaway Beach. Um, and uh, really incorporating the element of water and, and the history of the Atlantic Ocean. Um, Shaikh is specifically looking at the histories and meaningful, the meanings of the color uh, blue within African-American uh, communities and interested in this performance in particular in rethinking, reframing the way black masculinity is um, depicted. And so for this piece expect um, a quite large scale performance again with a choir with several dancers too uh, and something that will be taking place outdoors on the beach. Um, another uh, photographer initially who's also doing her very first performance with us is uh, Sarah Swinar who is known for these very intricate very complex um, installations of images Sarah is very, is obsessed with uh, the way we experience and consume images, be it in fashion magazine or magazines 
or online on you know social media um, and so she's been doing a lot of these very complex uh, compositions as three two-dimensional three-dimensional uh, works and then for the very first time she's turning these um, worlds really uh, in which all these different images come together to create a larger one as a live performance. And we're going to stage it um, in an old, um, well, in a, pre, in a former uh, shop, which used to be Top Shop on Fifth Avenue. And so the site also will be very meaningful for this work in particular that looks at our relationship to images and fashion, for instance. Um, and so the last two performances that I wanted you to spend more time with um, is by, um, one is by Kevin Beasley, an American artist uh, who has done performances in the past, but this time it's going to be his very first outdoor live performance, uh, which is going to take place in downtown Manhattan in the Lower East Side at the intersection of Orchard and Rivington. Um, Kevin was very interested in this idea of an intersection where different worlds, different populations, different neighborhoods meet and you know confront um, and contrast them. And so um, the performance is going to take place during the afternoon. He's looking at specifically uh, the everyday sounds, everyday gestures, everyday activities that you might not pay attention when you're walking on the street that will be um, magnified really by the performance uh, through a system of um, microphones. And we have a very short video in which Kevin um, uh, presents his work. And so I'm going to play this video for you. So this feels like really like a moment to kind of explore the texture of what the city provides and what this uh, what this sort of space and this architecture does as a as a kind of backdrop to these things can you and see the video what I'm really looking forward to is just the way that we cannot Charles oh, okay. One and the bodies exist in that space so I, I would, call again So this feels like and what about now? really like a moment Perfect. to kind of yep. explore the texture of what the city provides and what this, uh, what this sort of space and this architecture does as a, as a kind of backdrop to these things. And what I'm really looking forward to is just the way that the way that the sound and the bodies exist in that space. So I, I would say where it started, which isn't necessarily a time, it's more around a thing, is, is this, this idea of contact. And I didn't realize, you know, at the time thinking about it, it was for me very specifically around the, the contact microphone as like a, a, like a really raw transfer of like, movement and vibration so like even if it doesn't sound interesting and it's very like sharp and bumpy and they don't really sound that great unless you're really using it as like an effect or you're using it on 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 like musical instruments where there's a lot of resonance and they can really capture that resonance um and so, but I like, but I like that. I like the unpredictability of them, the difficulty of them. And I've used them a lot in a lot of works. And I've done this thing where I've kind of taken something that may be kind of simple and then sort of break it down and break it down. And I think that the genesis of, of this work is really around contact.
so li literally this piece is, is, is going to be about um, playing the street for uh, the audience who will be there in a very subtle, very uh, delicate way of like really emphasizing aspects that you might not really look at. And the other uh, uh, performance that I wanted to present, that I wanted to introduce you to is that also um, has a very strong dance component is by a, uh, a young artist also, Madeline Hollander, who's a visual artist and, um, and uh, choreographer. And Madeline really uh, from the start thought like, she was interested in uh, revisiting all um, these dances and these programs that were canceled during uh, uh, the pandemic last year. And so um, she had been thinking about actually previewing all these works and then obviously the pandemic really changed uh, the way she could approach that and so she reversed the her intention and the work has been for us to bring 25 different dancers from a dozen different iconic dance companies here in new york so new york city ballet bill t jones trisha brown martha graham uh, Le Mans, but also from Broadway. So we have people from West Side Story. We have people from Fiddler on the Roof. And, and Madeline wanted to work with them and specifically work with their, um, the system of marking. If you're a dancer, you're very familiar um, with this uh, element, um, but uh, it's something that usually you don't really see if you go see a performance. Marking is the way, uh, it's, a, it's a way dancers would actually uh, remember uh, the, the performance that they're going to uh, perform without having to really exhaust their, um, their body. So they are very simple, very uh, uh, subtle types of marking that only require hands to, to mark what, you know, a pirouette, a jump. And, but there are some that are a little bit more um, elaborate with a lot of uh, blo uh, space blocking, let's say. And, and Madeline for this piece in particular is really playing with all of these and, and really oscillating with these dif this different um, body memories that all these dancers carry in their bodies of all the performances that were never met, that never met an audience. Um, so I'm going to share my screen once again and show you um, some footage from our rehearsals this summer uh, at the Baryshnikov Art Center. I'm an artist and choreographer, and I'm working on a piece called Preview for the Performer Biennial that's coming out this October. Um, I've just spent two weeks with a group of dancers uh, who are from companies from all over New York City who have come together to share the same stage, or in this case, a studio, and present works that were canceled during the pandemic. Dancers from the Moan Dance Company, New York City Ballet, um, Bradford Graham, Trisha Brown, uh, the Met Metropolitan Opera, to name a few, and each of them has their specific repertory and their roles that they were rehearsing for up until the pandemic, and then they never got to present these books on the stage. <laughs> Some of these companies, you know, it was essentially their opening night that was canceled, or they made it to opening night, but then the whole tour was canceled, or it was something that was scheduled a bit later, and so they were in the middle of rehearsal, and they didn't even get to attack rehearsal, or towards the end of it, and there's something about spending that much time going through movement and really, you know, learning to finesse and, and practice with these groups of people, and then having everything shut down. And one of the things that's so interesting is you start to get these incredible and sometimes uncanny juxtapositions of Bertha Graham facing a city ballet balancing dancer, and it almost appears like they're dancing with each other, or you have some gestures from West Side Story kind of summoning um, someone from Trisha Brown, and because of their, by chance, their orientation, I mean, that they're either coming together or being, those moments start to light up. And 
and that's something that's been very different or has appeared very differently in every time we rehearse. It's part of the, the live aspect of this piece. And it's particularly live in the sense that every single performance and every single act will be very different than the next. You know, they begin together and it's this kind of silent cacophony of movement. And as they finish their roles, whether or not it's 15 minutes, 20 minutes, two minute variation, they take their bow and they exit the stage. So it begins with everyone at once and then slowly over time, as everyone finishes their repertory, they leave the stage. So it goes from a kind of chaotic mass to a solo. Um, and the last um, element of the biennial that I wanted to share with you. Um, so these are some images of Madeline's work and, and um, Kevin, but um, I also wanted, so uh, writing and publishing about performance um, has, is very important for us. You've seen uh, the timeline of uh, Rosalie's different books. Uh, and it's something that I think from the start, from the very first edition of the Biennial in 2005, it was very, it was crucial for the organization that we publish a book that is always done after uh, the Biennial, because as you imagine, they're all new productions. So we, we bring, uh, we invite writers, to, to attend them and then we work with them and, and write these different um, essays uh, with all the artists because um, about all these works, because it's, as I'm sure you understand, it's, it's always very, it's more difficult to, um, to really build scholarship around performance because of this ephemerality. And so from the start, obviously, we, th we thought, you know, we need to have these tools for the art historians of the future. Um, and so each biennial comes with its own catalog, its own book. Um, the past year obviously changed completely our plans. And so the way we uh, decided to um, reorganize um, our publication um, uh, from last year is to actually merge uh, two of our previous uh, biennials, 2017 and 2019, and to go even beyond and to really cover the past five years of the organization. So from 2016 to 2021. And through uh, that, to read through the works of all the uh, uh, performance and all the artists we work with, um, really rethink or understand all these different conversations that we've all had uh, over the past years. And how like through the lens of uh, the eyes of the artist, um, uh, we can really, grab and understand better social issues, political issues, economical issues through all these different live works. And so the performance, the, this book that we are uh, launching this month at the end of the month uh, is really doing that. It's a compendium of the past five years, but goes even beyond uh, to encompass all these different questions we have, all these different uh, conversations we've had through art. Um, and and these are the dates again of the biennial um, from October 12th to the 31st. If you go on the website, you'll see that a lot of the performances are already sold out. Uh, don't panic. There, uh, we will release more tickets progressively in the coming weeks. Uh, we also often, um, we do wait lists each time. So even if like, for instance, you have one uh, performance that you absolutely want to see and that you haven't been able to uh, get a ticket, um, we often are able to allow people uh, to join um, if, they sh if they come an hour before. And if really, really you can't make any of these performances because you're out of town or because that doesn't work with your schedule, uh, we will um, live stream them. Uh, and so you can actually see them from the comfort of your home. Um, well, I hope we will meet you all uh, this month at all these different performances. And, and I just want to thank again, the National Arts Club uh, and the Dance Committee in particular for this really wonderful invitation to um, present uh, this upcoming 
for my biennial. Thank you. Rosalie and Charles, thank you. That was just such a wonderful presentation. I've been to some of these performances way back in the 80s, and I have to say that, you know, going to the opera, going to the ballet, the, the experiences um, um, with Performa have been absolutely amazing. Um, Rosalie, I'm curious, what were your life experiences that inspired you to create Performa? Because being a historian, that could have taken you in various directions, not necessarily performa. So what was it that motivated you to do this? Such a good question. Um, you know, I think, uh, again, I come with a lot of different backgrounds. So the art historian was matched by being a dancer. And um, so there was always those two. Mm -hmm. And just a very brief uh, biographical note. Uh, I was at the Courtauld Institute in London, sort of, art history heaven and uh, really had to decide what my dissertation was and discovered the work of Oscar Schlemmer and uh, he talks about these two which he, he called two souls in his breast and they were conflicting so that was actually the start of my writing about performance uh, so I wrote my dissertation on Schlemmer and ex went through this very careful explanation understanding it both as the painter and the dancer I studied ballet tap Bharat Natyam I did the whole thing Spanish everything uh, and um, so that's the very personal uh, place where it all comes together. And, you know, it's a bit of that uh, I couldn't decide which way to go. So I decided to write about the problem. So that's where all the books come from, because <laughs> I really felt I, I somehow had a way to I wanted to explain these relationships that, again, we weren't in these separate areas. And um, and then, like uh, was mentioned earlier, you know, I, I was director of the gallery at the Royal College of Art in London right out of school and immediately was, I, I think I'm an obsessed educator and, and just in the biggest sense that I feel art has so much, brings so much knowledge with it, so many different ways of looking at it. And so just a, a real excitement and a determination to bring as many people into that conversation as possible. Mm -hmm. So I think what I was doing at the Royal College is very similar to what I was doing at the kitchen in the, in the late 70s. Uh, always this question of how do all these different media feed each other, critique each other, uh, inspire us, the viewer, you know, and so on. So starting performer was actually now that I look back, it's just a, a kind of straight but wiggly line, but it's, it's a really direct line. It's, um, you know, the logistics of it too are, are amazing to me. Um, what's the mix? Do artists come to you? Do you search for artists? I mean, I'm sure it must be a little bit of both, but where's no, the neither? <laughs> so how does it all? Neither. I mean, it's very it all... interesting, yeah. actually, to try to uh, to just dismiss that, but it's true. We uh, we neither we don't look for proposals and we don't search for artists because, uh, again, that example. I'm I didn't give the early example, but you know, it, this really comes from. I mentioned it with Rashid, loving somebody's falling, knowing. I think. You know, in the beginning, I think I was I was making all the choices. So, but now we have curators who are with us for long enough, mm -hmm. uh, and so the beginning. But even now, it's still an artist who somehow the work has this other dimension. You just feel what would happen if I think the very first piece that I commissioned was in, actually tw uh, twenty years ago was Shirin Eshat. I don't know if you're familiar with her work, and it was almost like what would happen if those people stepped off the film into the stage, onto the space, because I found her work so powerful. It was political, it was men and women, it was East and West, it was Muslim and, you know, every other religion. And somehow, the, and there were visually, it was visual theater, visual, you know, in the most powerful way. And I, that's that was my first commission. I came back to New York, I haven't seen that in Venice, and said to Shirin, would you ever consider doing a live performance? And those were my words, you know, like just having people walk off your film into space. And she said, let's do it. And so that's that was the starting point. And then we went from there to, so no, nobody, this is, you know, we only work, I think the most we've ever done in the year is about 12, which is crazy, but, uh, and this is the, the, the tightest group. Um, but, you know, the enormous amount of work goes into, it's, it's, it's a really working closely with the artists. It's not like, oh, hey, you have a commission, come back in two years, here's your space, here's your money, here's your budget. Mm -hmm. It's really a, a close-knit 
uh, ongoing conversation with the artist and build a collaboration. Them. Yeah, it's and I don't really call it that in the, in, the, in the big sense because obviously mm -hmm. the artist is, is the lead. We're trying to realize their ideas at all costs, but we are there to be a safety net to to be to be critical and carefully carefully so and suggest mm -hmm. and so on. So. Um, so yes, yeah, so each artist, each curator, in a sense, comes up. There is some, you know, with puts forward a couple of suggestions of artists that they've been dreaming of working with for years. Oh. Um, Kathy Noble, one of our other curators, is you know when I first talked to her, she wanted to do something on Erica Beckman and has always wanted to do something with Erica. So her dream comes true. She gets to spend two years working with Erica. So it really comes from that. Uh, and again, because no one's done the performance before, it's not like, oh, I just saw so-and-so at the Holland Festival. Let's bring them to New York. We're not presenters. We're deeply, we commission new ideas, new work across all disciplines. We, you know, we don't represent something. So nobody knows what they're getting. That's why I say 100% risk, 100% trust on both sides. Both sides, sure. You know, so, yeah. and that risk is, is the adventure of the artists. I think artists wake up every day and take 100% rich like, risk like why should people believe in what i have to say no, you know true um another question is if you could please talk a bit about what it feels like to be teaching students now what is your hope for your students that look up to you and aspire to follow your path what do you want them to accomplish and what do you hope for our generation this person sounds like they know you Gemma. Well, she's in my class, yes. Okay. I asked her to listen in and give her perspective. Uh, that's terrific because, um, you know, I think my I do really think about each student and where they're trying to go. I think your first question to me was, how did you come to do this? Uh, mm -hmm. It's not something when you study art history. Well, famously, I think one of our presidents recently said, like, forget about art history. <laughs> go into uh, science and medicine. But anyway, um, one of our Anyway, so yes, um, there is no direction. And I try to really listen carefully to each student uh, and get a sense of where they should be and could be. So I'm very, I also deeply believe in art history and history in general, history, history, history. You can never get enough history. That's the sort of, it's, it's a sounding board. It's an inspiration. It's, it's kind of like pushing forward. So I think knowledge moving, uh, as, as deeply through ideas as possible. And then I'm insisting too that this is, we're in this contemporary world. I mean, I really didn't need to do performer. I, I, well, I did feel I needed to because I felt the subject matter wasn't understood. But, uh, you know, the question for the, the, the students is, you know, what are you going to do? You cannot just sit in this very privileged art world and take all its riches and think you're, you know, you, it's, it, there's a responsibility to really work with what this material is telling us to work carefully with artists. So my, and I like to think also that I, you know, it's, it's an opportunity. I have too many stories to tell. I need to download all the stories. And also the sense that, you know, I, I do explain to them. If you want to do what you, if you think you want to do what I'm doing, read every newspaper, read every, pay yeah. attention, see, read the times, read the, you know, read, 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 pay attention to what the contemporary, what is going on politics, how the economics is changing, how that's affecting you. So it's a little bit like if you want to do that, get inside my head and I'll, I'll expose it all and try to explain it all. But there's a lot to learn. And uh, I just try to uh, move the students along. And again, back to this very individual, even though it's always a seminar class I teach of 20 students, I really try to go to each student and find out from each one, where do you think you want to be five years from now? And are we going to, we're going to make something happen in really in, enhance your time here so we can really push that along. So it's a, it's a big, uh, yeah, it's a big commitment to human beings and next generation and making sure they have the courage to do wonderful things. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's a wonderful answer. Well, I want to thank you and Charles for a wonderful presentation. I want to thank the audience for being here tonight. Check out this program. The uh, link to the schedule is in the chat box. Please copy it. Um, don't miss any of it. It just sounds so fabulous. So, thank you so much. And thank you to everyone at uh, National Arts Club. Our pleasure. That's Our so pleasure. fabulous. Thank you. Our pleasure. Thank so, you so much. Um, thanks very much. And, um, and good night, everybody.
Good night. Thank Good night. you. Thank you.